In the 1960s, we had the technology to dial a telephone call to anywhere in the United States and Canada. The person making the call could dial the number, and the equipment could take care of the rest. This was being done without computers. Have you ever wondered how there could be a nationwide communications network able to connect anyone to anyone with no computers? If you're like most people, I'd guess you haven't thought about it, because nowadays computers are everywhere, in everything, and when you think about the telephone system that we must have had before computers became widespread, how'd they do it? Well, it's kind of like the cars that we had that didn't used to have computers in them. Except the telephone network was made of components that were much more varied than cars. This is a dial tone. Calls from telephones, at least telephones that had a dial on them, began with one of these. However, there were a lot of different dial tones. This particular one you would tend to get in cities served by the Bell system, that is Alexander Graham Bell's telephone company. This dial tone was found in rural areas served by the Bell system. Here's another Bell System rural dial tone. This one has the same pitch as that city dial tone we heard before, but a different timbre. Though telephone service in the 1970s was a monopoly service, not all telephone companies were part of the Bell System. In other words, there were areas where your one and only phone company was a so-called independent. And in independent companies, there was even a greater variety of dial tones. You get the idea, and we've only scratched the surface as far as that goes. Dial tones like those were generated by machines that had moving parts. There weren't even any transistors involved, never mind computers. When computers finally did become a part of the old network in the late 1960s, they had only a peripheral role. The system as a whole was not digital at all. It was electromechanical, and an electromechanical system doesn't sound the same as a digital system. Hello again. I'm now speaking to you through a 1960s Bell System telephone over a connection that my friend Ben Decibel recorded in New York City. This is one of many ways that calls within a northern American city could sound during the 1960s and 70s. It's a fairly noisy example. The sound of this phone call comes from the almost 2,000 hours of the old analog telephone network sounds that Ben and I recorded during the 1970s and early 1980s. Why did we make so many recordings of the old analog network? There are actually several answers to that question, so hang with me for a while, and I'll show you. This phone call, for example, took a long time to set up, or go through, as we used to say back in the day. I'm sorry, your call did not go through. Oh, yes, it did. In fact, let's take another listen to the way this call went through, starting with the last digit dialed on a rotary dial phone. I'll just run the tape back here. 
Okay, here we are again. And in fact, every one of those sounds makes total sense because it audibly illustrates the precise processes that were being used by the old network to set up the call. Everything was done in a more linear manner than it's done nowadays. And by just listening, you could effectively watch the network doing its thing. Now this call from Ben's house is just one way that a call to a part of the city that's about 10 miles away could sound. Let's stay at Ben's house for a minute and make a long-distance call. Now, in the 1960s and 70s, long-distance calls had a certain feel and sound all their own. And people knew the sound of long-distance. When the phone rang and you answered it, most people could tell that it was a long-distance call. On this call I'm going to make, we're going to deliberately dial an unassigned telephone number. Here, we're going to get a telephone company recorded announcement and briefly speak to an operator. As for how this call goes through after we dial the last digit, we'll be hearing different sounds this time. Here's a call to an unassigned number in Kankakee, Illinois, as dialed from Ben's house in Queens. This long distance connection has a certain charm to it. This is a recording. The number you have reached is not in service at this time. If you think you might have dialed incorrectly, please try your call again. And also you can feel the distance. May I repeat, the number you have reached is not a working number. Thank you. What number are you calling, please? 939-3939. Thank you. Nine three nine three nine three nine. Yeah. No such number. Check your number again, will you please? Sure. All right. This is one example of the sound of long distance. And as you listen to this background noise, it feels kind of alive. And the reason is that in the background, underneath the white noise, you can actually hear sounds of other calls. This phenomenon was called crosstalk, and in the old network you would encounter it in many places. It was expected to happen and it was all kept within reasonable specifications. Here it's not loud enough to interfere with conversations. But every now and then you'd encounter a place where things had gotten out of whack. And it could sound like this. That didn't happen very often. And every now and then we would run into it just dialing a normal call, and there it was. We would try to get the phone company to fix it. And of course, the minute one of their test guys heard that, they 
knew a circuit needed to be corrected. But there were other parts of the network where they weren't so careful to make sure that crosstalk was within bounds. For an example, let's go to my Long Island home and pick up my private line, circa 1970, and dial three digits that no telephone number begins with. This is going to go to one of those recordings that plays over and over. By the way, in this area we have modern dial tone. This kind of a dial tone first started appearing around 1965. However, all places didn't get it until sometime in the 1980s. And even after that, there were a few far-flung exceptions. Anyway, let's finish dialing three digits that don't begin any phone number and are not an area code. That's a pretty low volume recording. I'll turn up the volume so you can hear it better. This plays over and over, and it's arranged so that more than one caller can hear it at a time. In fact, I can tell from this tape that there are other callers on the line right now because you're hearing some clicks. Those. There it is again, and again, and again, and again. Those clicks are caused by other customers' rotary dialing phone numbers. The reason they're dialing is that people connect to this recording after the first three digits they dial, but most people are trying to dial a seven-digit phone number, and so those clicks are crosstalk from other callers trying to dial the rest of their phone number. Those callers haven't noticed that they're connected to a recording, so they continue dialing, and we're hearing it because this recording arrangement has a lot of crosstalk. So much crosstalk, in fact, that at some point in the late 1960s, local teenagers discovered that they could actually talk to each other through this recording, taking advantage of the crosstalk. And by the time I discovered this in mid-1970, it sounded like this. Now you know that recording sounds pretty ratty as far as these things go, and I just wanted to let you know that the network had some beautiful recorded announcements. Here's one from North Carolina. After I dial the last digit, you'll hear some of those call going through sounds. I'm sorry, the number you have reached is not in service at this time. If you need assistance, please hang up and dial your directory assistance operator. This is a recording in Ashboro, North Carolina. I'm sorry, the number you have reached is not in service at this time. Did the old network sound that good with such good high frequency response? Yes, if you were calling within the same neighborhood. Now let's go to present time for just a minute. Hello again. This was recorded through the Sprint Cellular Network in 2019. This is the sound quality that I usually have to put up with on my everyday calls. Now, to me, this is just plain unpleasant. To make matters worse, 
Over a connection like this, speech is so distorted that consonants are often indistinguishable, requiring me to ask people to repeat themselves. That which is newer isn't always better. This is how both local and long-distance calls usually sound on my iPhone as I record this in 2019. Would you like to hear how calls could sound in the 1970s? This is what a local call within the same neighborhood typically sounded like in the old network. Now I'm speaking through a traditional phone that has a carbon microphone, and these phones have kind of a raspy quality, but it is highly intelligible. This is how it sounds as recorded by a 1970s mid-priced cassette machine, and so there's a lot more background hiss than the actual network had. In reality, it was more like this. What's interesting is that this connection has a really good high frequency response, way above 6 kilohertz, and this was typical for calls within the same neighborhood. The reason is that there was nothing really separating your phone from the phone of the person you called, except a couple of capacitors which were designed to let the sound right through, and there was no processing or digitization or anything to impose a hard limit on frequency response. Now, if I switch to a 1980s telephone that has a regular microphone, now you can hear the way the network really sounded in and of itself without the distortion inherent in the carbon mic phone. The carbon mics, even though they were raspy sounding, had some real advantages for clear communication, including the automatic elimination of background noise. So this is the highest quality you would get in the old network, calling within the same neighborhood and now, here's an example of one of the lower quality calls, although I have to say, this way of putting a call through is still very charming to me. This is the sort of thing that you would often get on calls between 25 and 100 miles away. It wasn't as good as long distance, but it has a charm all its own. Here's a call from Lindbrook, Long Island, to Rhinebeck, New York. I'm sorry, we're unable to complete your call as dialed. Please check the number and dial again or ask your operator for assistance. This is a recording. 91412. Just as a reference, here is another same neighborhood call to one of those high quality recordings, although it isn't perfect. I recorded this from a payphone in Brazelton, Georgia. This is one of the independent rural ringtones. a number that has been disconnected or is no longer in service. If you feel you have reached this recording in error, please check the number or try your call again. This is a recording, 404654, vacant level. Ah, that tone at the end there, you can tell that it was made by a mechanical device. It doesn't even have a transistor in it. The system that delivered the recording does have transistors, but it's not a digital recording. There really weren't any in those days. Not high quality.
Instead, it's recorded on a metal drum that has a coating of magnetic material similar to that which is on videotape. Okay, now where was I before I got off on sound quality? Oh yes, in the 1970s, we had a subculture which was almost completely unacknowledged in the media. This was young people meeting each other over the phone, taking advantage of the crosstalk that the phone company unwittingly put into their arrangements for delivering recordings and even busy signals. This was the first one that I knew about. Right, now I have a friend named Charlie whose entire life revolved around this particular meeting place, which was incorrectly called the party line. Charlie was 17 at the time, and he was using the party line to meet girls, and he met quite a few. And... I was obsessed by it. It was wild. It really took, took over me. You know, it's like how people now get, you know, hooked on the computers. I, I, I was up all night long on party line, 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. I couldn't get up for school the next day. Thanks to several authors, including Phil Lapsley, who wrote Exploding the Phone, the story of people like me, who developed technical knowledge about the phone network, doing amazing things with it, has been told, although I've got a lot more to say. But the story that has not been told is how the network was so porous, providing so many meeting places just waiting to be used, that ordinary people who didn't have technical expertise would find these places. Here's an example from Atlanta. In 1978, a popular radio station, WQXI, had its telephone number changed. Well, for a while there, if you called their old phone number, you'd get this. QXI's AM call-in number is now 741-0790. And QXI's FM call-in number is now 741-0094. This is a request. Those kids were not told that by some technical whiz. They found it by themselves. They just dialed the old number, and after the recording, there was a place where if you said hello and somebody else was there, they'd hear you. And it got going that way. Now this is a busy signal. And in the old network, busy signals often had some crosstalk. But every now and then, you'd find one that had a lot of crosstalk. That was another Atlanta example. That happened in 1983, pretty late, but the old network still had a few tricks up its sleeve. Now, the examples I've showed you so far are all pretty hectic, but there were some places, especially in New York, where the phone company was supposed to have a recording and everything was all set for the recording. They just forgot the recording. And in cases like that, you'd get things like this. Now there you have an actual social group that has formed around one of these conference lines that the phone company didn't even mean to create. 
so the more hectic ones were used for meeting people and people would shout out phone numbers and hang up and call each other, but the quiet ones actually became kind of a social club. And there was almost zero media coverage of this phenomenon. It was happening organically all over the place, especially in New York and Los Angeles. As for us phone freaks, we had conference lines of our own where we would meet and talk shop. Here, in a 1972 example, Derek from the UK is telling everyone about a time number in the UK that is atypical. He suggests a particular routing through the UK system for Captain Crunch, a California phone freak, to use to call up the time number. But Bill Acker from New York, probably the world's greatest phone freak, catches him in an error. Apparently Bill is aware of a change in the UK telephone network that Derek, who lives there, hadn't realized yet. John? Yeah. John, if you want to hear an unusual English-speaking clock? Sure. I'll give you an interesting routing. Bill probably knows this one. Um, what's the best way? Come up, country code 44. Yeah. 51. Yeah. 187. Yeah. 63581. Dad, made two mistakes. I did not. Yes, you did. Where? First of all, why do it that way when you can now 44 53481? It's no longer 635, it's now 47. It will take, um, it will take uh, 534? Yes. I didn't know you could take 534 over 44. Would you guys go over that code with me one more time? 44, 534, Oh, you want me to dial it up? Yeah, can yeah. I do it? Sure, stand by. Bill? Yes? When did that, when did that 635 go to 47? Um, I don't know, but back in, no, November we tried it. Oh, well, well, well. well. I'll explain a few and your terms to me. Oh. Seconds. The time is four thirteen precisely. The time is four thirteen and ten seconds. The time is And we knew what he meant because we all knew that the two gateways for the UK were White Plains, New York, and Pittsburgh. And by now, I'm sure you know what this was. Unusual, but that again was crosstalk in the UK network this time, such that occasionally two people calling the time of day number at the same time could actually hear each other. We were hearing the background noise in some British home where someone there had called the time. One of the cool things about the network in general is that there was more than one type of telephone switching system. Unlike cars, which pretty much worked all the same way, telephone switching systems were extremely varied in how they worked, and you could really hear the difference. When telephones first became a public utility, there weren't any switching systems, there were just live operators with switchboards, plugs, and jacks. Then, one of the independent companies, not the Bell system, came up with the idea of the automatic telephone. The first way of doing this was designed by an undertaker who suspected that his local telephone operator was in cahoots with his competitor, sending his calls to the other guy. This motivated him to design a system where you didn't need an operator and customers could operate the switching themselves from their phone. That system, known as step-by-step -step switching, or merely Stroger, which was the guy's name, got refined and improved and ended up being the most commonly used switching system in the world. Welcome to New Tripoli, Pennsylvania. That's spelled New Tripoli. There's an independent telephone company here and they're using step-by-step -step equipment. As we make a call to Allentown, you'll be able to hear why this equipment is called step-by-step. -step. I'm going to dial the first digit. In regular step-by-step, -step, the subscriber's telephone dial directly operates the switches in the central office to progress the call along. 
We've dialed the first digit, and we've actually taken one step toward our destination. We're still sitting on what's called a selector in the Nutripoli central office. Now when we dial the second digit, this is the connection to Allentown that our call is going to use. And here it is, even though we've only dialed two digits so far. This is a characteristic of the step-by-step -step switching system. That noise there was just crosstalk from other activity in our step-by-step -step central office. Some other subscriber was making a call. And that was more of the same. I had to go ahead and dial the third digit because the Allentown equipment isn't going to let me delay forever. We've been connected to the central switching machine for the Allentown local network since the second digit, and this connection we've gotten is one of the standard types used for medium distance and long local calls. This Allentown switch is super modern for the 1970s. It's a kind of electronic switching where it still makes old-fashioned analog connections, but the smart of the system is a computer in this case. It's not going to do anything until we finish dialing the rest of the number. We're about to dial the last digit, and about a second and a half after we do, we're going to hear a distinctive tick, which is the sound of the Allentown electronic switch connecting us through to the switching system that serves the number we're actually calling. The connecting tick is that. With step by step, you can hear the actual connection your call is going to take being built as you're dialing. The Bell system came out with their first dial telephone system in 1922. It was called the Panel Dial System because of the panel that all the selectors were mounted on. And while, like step, your call does go through while you're dialing the number, that number that you're dialing has to be converted into a different numerical code that will move the panel selectors to the right positions to get your call through. So there has to be a device on the line to convert what you dial into the numerical code that the panel selectors require. Also, panel selectors move at their own speed, and so the device has to accommodate that as well. When the Bell system came out with panel, it had to be different from step-by-step step because Mr. Stroger's patent was still in effect, and if they'd infringed, he could have hauled them into court and just buried them. No, just kidding. Actually, by 1922, he'd sold the patents anyway, but they weren't free and clear yet. So panel is very different and has some advantages over step. And so what you hear while you're dialing are the pulses being used by the sender under the instructions of the decoder to set up the panel switches so that your call goes to the right place. You don't actually get to hear that call until after you've dialed the last digit. But you do hear pulsing, which is the sender communicating with the panel switches. So it's kind of cool. Here is a local call made from a Brooklyn payphone that is served by the panel switching system in 1977. <laughs> With the panel system, you don't get to hear your dial directly controlling the switches. But because that sender is there, it feels kind of alive. You're dialing, and then it's communicating with the selectors through that pulsing. At the end, you get this final crush of static, and your call's gone through. The fundamental building block of all of these electromechanical systems is the relay. And if you don't know what a relay is, definitely look it up because it's the key to everything.
The crossbar switch was a very efficient and inexpensive way to construct what was essentially a matrix of relays. And once the crossbar switch had been invented, there were numerous ways to put them together and make them work, so there were quite a number of crossbar-based switching systems. Each of them worked in a unique way, and they all sounded different. In 1938, the Bell system came out with its first crossbar-based switching system, which they called Number One Crossbar. Although its workings were completely different from the panel switching system, it had a sender similar to panel that sounded very much the same. Except instead of hearing pulsing like this all the time, you would more often hear metallic gonging like this. Here's a local call from a number one crossbar office to a different neighborhood. In 1948, the Bell system came out with number 5 crossbar, which was amazingly advanced for something that had no computers. It wasn't especially interesting to listen to, but we have a lot of tapes of it. We record from number 5 crossbar when there's something to call from it, especially the long distance network. More on that later. The independent telephone companies had crossbar systems. Here's one made by ITT called Pentaconta. Unlike its Bell system counterparts, with this you have dead silence while you're dialing the number, but you can clearly hear the pulsing being used to communicate to the switch being called, which in this case is a step-by-step. Meanwhile, North Electric's NX1 crossbar has lots of noise on the line while you're dialing. And if you make a same neighborhood call, there's a special string of pulsing that you hear right after the last digit. This. didn't hang up long enough, so it put on a busy signal. That's an NX1 thing. NX1s make a lot of fascinating sounds, and of course those sounds have meaning. Here is the way a long distance call starts to go through from one of the NX1s in Greenville, North Carolina. And here we have the long distance noise, and then the call will go through to whatever destination. If we just focus in on the way long distance calls start to go through in various places, we'll see even greater contrasts because there are more variables. In the 70s, there were still some places where you would dial the number, and then a live operator would come on the line briefly to ask for the number you were dialing from. This was a cost saving measure. The technology existed to do it all automatically, it's just that at that point in the 70s, it was cheaper to do it this way. Here's the way it sounded in Jacksonville, North Carolina. Three four seven two three five five. And here's the long distance noise again. Here's another example from Hague, Virginia. On this, you don't hear multi frequency tones, just more pulsing noises than in the last example. Your number, please. 472 2906.
During this time period, even within the same house, you would often find two telephone lines, each of which was served by a different type of telephone switching system. My house in 1970 had two lines, one for my parents and one for me, and there was a big difference in how long distance calls went through. From my line, it sounded the same as at Ben's house, like this. But from my parents' line, long distance calls went through like this. So if I wanted to hear a completely different set of telephone sounds, I could just walk across the house and use the other phone line. My personal line, along with Ben's lines, was number one crossbar, and my parents' line was number five crossbar. And in our part of New York State, that meant that long distance calls would sound either like this, etc., or this, depending upon whether you were using number one or number five crossbar. Now, from my parents' number five crossbar line, here are a few long distance calls, each of which goes to a different ringtone. And by ringtone, I don't mean the sound your phone makes when it rings. After all, in my day, phones rang like this. Or if you had one of those fancy trim line or princess models, those rang like this. No, by ringtone, I mean the sound that you hear when you are calling another person and their phone is ringing. They were created by large rotating devices in the basement of the telephone company's central office building. So let's make a few long distance calls, all of which start out the same way and have that long distance sound, but they each go to a different ringtone. After the first one, I'll omit the dialing. I'm sorry, we are unable to complete your call as dialed. Please check the number and dial again or ask your operator for assistance. This is a recording. 
602-2. I'm sorry, we are unable to complete your call as dialed. On this call, the ringtone we heard turned out to be just the introduction to this recording, which is coming from the main long-distance switching machine in Phoenix, Arizona. I got this by picking up my parents' phone in Long Island, dialing the correct area code for Arizona, and then a telephone number that couldn't possibly be assigned. The call went through to Phoenix, and the switching machine there caught the error and gave us this recording. And by the way, the numerical ID is what indicates this recording is coming from the main Phoenix long-distance switch. Anyway, I wanted to show you something that many of the phone freaks individually discovered. We didn't all discover it the same way, but one famous example comes from Captain Crunch Cereal, where for a while they were giving away a free whistle in the cereal box. I'm going to take one of these Captain Crunch whistles, block one of the air holes, and blow it into the phone. Complete your call is dialed. Please check the number and dial again. Well, the recording's gone. But as you can tell by this background noise, we are still, at least partly, connected to the long-distance network. I'm sorry, your call did not go through. Will you please hang up and try again? This is a recording, 6022. And after 15 seconds, we got a different recording. I'm sorry, your call did not go through. This time, it says your call did not go through. This is a recording, 602. John Draper of California, perhaps the most famous phone freak, went by the name Captain Crunch. I'm sure you can see why, because that whistle was very important. Although it wasn't the whistle, it was the tone it makes. Sorry, your call did not go through. Will you please hang up and try again? So what's going on here? Well, the Captain Crunch whistle, as well as a bell that I had, and a tonette that Bill Acker had, all make the same sound. It's a 2600 hertz tone, which if you put it down the phone line when a long distance call was connected, I'll use my bell this time. Sorry, your call did not go through. That tone causes the destination of the phone call to be disconnected, but we are still on a very long connection that goes all the way from Long Island in New York to Phoenix, Arizona. And 15 seconds after we... Okay, there it goes again. I'm sorry, your call did not go through. Will you please hang up and try... As I was saying, 15 seconds after we send a 2600 hertz tone down the line, the Phoenix Long Distance switch connects us to this recording that says your call did not go through. And the reason is that when we send the tone, the Long Distance switch in Phoenix actually thinks that we hung up. Now we didn't, but the tone makes it think that we did. And that's because that tone is used by the phone company to send down these long distance lines so that one end can know when the other disconnected. And as soon as my whistle stops or my bell fades out, Phoenix hears that and thinks that it has a new call to deal with. That sound there is caused by the fact that Phoenix is sending a signal back to New York to say, OK, I'm ready. Tell me what phone number you want. But it's not getting a phone number, so... I'm sorry. Shut up. You're called... Now the question is, is there a way to give it a phone number because Phoenix is waiting for one? Well, there is. I have a tape of tones here. Hello. You have correctly dialed the long-distance test number. I'm John Davis of the telephone company, and you're hearing me on a recording. You have seen how easy it is to dial your long-distance calls, and I hope you will continue to dial out-of-town calls whenever you can. Well, if he knew how I did this, I'm not sure he'd be encouraging me to do it whenever I can. But in any case, what I've just done is redirected this call 
from Phoenix to this test recording in Amarillo, Texas. We blew the 2600, which reset the line to Phoenix, and Phoenix was waiting for a number, so I gave it this number, and now it's gone through to Amarillo. In 4.30 a.m. and all day Sunday. I hope you'll use our long-distance service often. Oh, I do. You know, next best to being there is talking there by long distance. Goodbye, and happy dialing. Do I mean to say that in the 1970s, armed with just a whistle and a tape recorder, you could redirect your phone call wherever you wanted to? Yes, and it was wonderful. We got to know the network so well. Sometimes late at night, we would just sit on these long distance lines and listen to the sound. Now in the 1980s, this activity became impossible but the recordings we're hearing right now are from the 70s. The language I'm using to tell Phoenix what number I want, it's those tones that we've been hearing when we dial calls from many places. You've been hearing them through this whole program. They're not the same as the tones that telephones make. It's a different system. Now, many people built an electronic device called a blue box to make these network tones. But you know, you could also play these tones on an electric piano or a synthesizer or especially electric organs. I never had a blue box, but I did use my Arp Odyssey synthesizer to make the tones and control the network. But I'll be doing it with recordings of the tones on tape in this demonstration. The call to Amarillo is still up. When I blow 2600 again, we'll drop back to Phoenix so the line's going to get a little quieter. And let's call something that can't be dialed in the 1970s. In the middle 1970s, parts of the Caribbean could be dialed by everyone, but some areas could not, such as Antigua and Barbados. Let's get the recording from the main switching machine in Barbados by using area code 178, which is not dialable from your phone, but operators are able to call it. So I'll blow the whistle, that will drop the Amarillo part of the connection. We'll still be connected to Phoenix. The line will get a little quieter. And then I'll play a tape that I've made up in advance to get the Barbados recording. I am sorry. We are unable to complete your call as dialed. Please check the number and dial again. This is a recording from Barbados. I am sorry. We are unable to complete your call as dialed. Please check the number and dial again. This is a recording from Barbados. The telephone equipment in Barbados is definitely British, although this tone here isn't really. Sounds more European. Stopped. Anyway, next is a ringtone in Barbados, which sounds exactly like some of the ringtones that you could hear in London. Got a lot quieter because the main link that these calls go through is Phoenix to Jacksonville, Florida. And when that's gone, like now, it's quieter. It'll come right back on, though, when I play these tones. There it is. That's the Jacksonville link coming on. There's Barbados and... That was a silent call to a directory inquiries operator. Sorry I didn't talk to her. That was recorded before I did this compilation. Now Antigua is not dialable by customers and they know it because the recording there doesn't even say, please hang up and try again. It says, please clear down and try again. 
That's terminology used by operators. So I'm going to blow the whistle. It'll get quieter because then we'll have only the Phoenix connection. Then I'll play the tones to get the recording in Antigua. Can you feel the distance? There's something wonderful about this network, but this is just the long distance part of the network. There were also medium distance networks that had a completely different feel. There was one in southern upstate New York that I've documented pretty well on some programs that are called the Hi-Fi 914 Routings Tape. And then there are local networks. I'll have to talk about those for a minute. So let's say goodbye to Antigua via Jacksonville. Now we still have the Phoenix connection, but I'm going to have to really hang up this time. Either that or key in another number, because you know what it's going to do. I'm sorry. Your call did not go through. Ah, shut up. Will you please... Just kidding. So what you've just heard is a really brief sample of what it's like to hang out on the long-distance network. To us, it was a thing of beauty. But the local networks had a whole different feel. In fact, each and every local network was unique. And that's the reason why I have made so many stops at payphones in places like North Carolina, recording the independent company's local networks, because as I would go from town to town, I would find a completely different and unique environment in each place. And then there was New York City, filled with the two most interesting to observe switching machines, number one crossbar and panel. And as you'd go from one neighborhood to another, each number one crossbar or panel switching machine had its own distinctive sound signature. And for that reason, Ben Decibel spent an unbelievable amount of time standing at payphones, recording as many of the number one crossbars and panel offices as he could in New York City. Now, most of the tapes and my narrated programs are about the actual sounds of switching. What you've heard in this program is scratching the surface, but I've shown you a lot of variety to give you an idea of why we recorded so much and why there's so much cool stuff to listen to now. That's pretty much the end of this program, which I've made in order to give everyone an idea of what's on the tapes, what there is to listen to of the old analog network. This is a rough draft of this program. I'm going to be revising it a lot. But in the meantime, I wanted to go ahead and put out this version because I think it's a helpful introduction. Also, I need to apologize that as far as my narrated programs go, there are still a lot of gaps in explanatory data. My original plan was to do the How I Became a Phone Freak series, and that series would cover all the technical information that was required to understand the other narrated programs. That hasn't worked out because those programs take a very, very long time to produce and hopefully I will still be able to do them. But it's just going to take longer than I thought. So I apologize for the gaps in explanatory data. I'm trying other things to get as much information out there as possible so that you're not listening to this stuff and going, huh? This program is also going to have end notes because there's a lot of things that I could not say because there wasn't time. So I was going to put those at the end, but this rough draft doesn't have those yet. So just know I'll be back with an updated version of this at some point that has a lot of endnotes. You'll want to skip past those anyway in most cases. Next up on the playlist called Group 1 are How I Became a Phone Freak, Episode 1, and then Episode 2. <laughs>